Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Wonderful. Okay. I'm going to read a little bit um, from my book. This is chapter six. Um, and it's titled, Is Police Brutality Really About Race? Just got over for just got pulled over for driving while black. Here's hoping I get out of it safely. This was a tweet I sent out July of 2015, along with a photo of the officer who had pulled me over. I was driving with my two brothers on the freeway, moving with traffic, slightly over the speed limit. The ticket given put me at one mile per hour over the speed limit. I watched the motorcycle co cross three lanes of traffic to pick my vehicle out of the crowd, slowing all traffic to guide me back to the other side of the busy freeway. As we waited for the officer to walk up to the passenger side window, my brothers and I tried to calm ourselves down. Just stay calm, don't ask questions, we'll be okay, my brother Aham repeated in a voice that betrayed his fear and also his determination to see us all get through this encounter intact. It was then that I sent the alert to friends and family. The tweet I sent once we were stopped on the side of the road is similar to what many of my black friends send out these days when they are pulled over. This message is sent out not so much to complain, but to notify friends and family that if something should happen to you in the near future, this was the likely cause. As we've learned, witnesses are the only defense people of color seem to have against police brutality and often even that isn't enough. Our encounter with the officer was over quickly, although it felt like an eternity. He was brusque and professional while we silently sat in fear, watching our hands to make sure they didn't betray us with any sudden movements, any threatening gestures. Aham's hand shook as he opened my glove compartment to get my vehicle registration, slowly and clearly telling the officer, I'm reaching into the glove compartment now and waiting for the officer's nod before moving. Watching my brother carefully reach for the glove compartment, I was reminded of one time when I was pulled over at 16. I quickly reached for the glove compartment when asked for license and registration, and the officer's hand immediately went to his gun as he yelled, stop. As I sat there frozen in fear, he proceeded to lecture me to never reach for anything in front of a cop without saying what I was doing first. That's a good way to get yourself shot, young lady, he said to me. Then he nodded and took his hand off his gun, satisfied with the favor he had done me by not shooting a 16-year-old girl for reaching for her identification. But this officer did not shout or reach for his gun. He simply wrote out my ticket and then drove off. When the officer was gone, we sat for a moment and collected ourselves. We looked at each other, grateful that we were all okay. I sent out a quick tweet letting everyone know that we were okay, and then I started driving again, dreading the rest of the long trip that moments earlier we had been looking forward to, and driving slowly enough to anger everyone else on the road. When I got home, I had dozens of messages waiting for me from friends and community members, voicing concern at my first tweet and relief at my second. Many of those messages came from other black people who related to the fear behind my initial tweet and shared their own stories of their DWBs. But there were plenty of other messages from people wondering why I had brought race into it at all. Why do you assume it's about race? You have no proof it was anything other than a specific tra than a traffic stop. Wouldn't it be better to just assume good intentions on behalf of the cop? How do you know it's about race? And the truth is, I didn't know it was about race, and I still don't. There's a very good chance that I just won that horrible lottery in my car with three black individuals, was the one car to be pulled over out of pure luck. Maybe we're all just really unlucky as a race. And while I have, may have been pulled over due to the luck of the draw, the thing is, I can't ask why. The last time my brother asked a cop why he'd been pulled over, the cop leaned into the vehicle and asked ominously, are we going to have a problem here? So he doesn't ask anymore. And after seeing what happened to Sandra Bland, I certainly don't ask either. 
If we don't know if each individual encounter with police officers is truly about race, and if we can't safely ask, why do we talk about police brutality like it is about race? At its core, police brutality is about power and corruption. Police brutality is about the intersection of fear and guns. Police brutality is about accountability. And the power and corruption that enable police brutality put all citizens of every race at risk. But it does not put us at risk equally. And the numbers bear that out. My fear as a black driver is real. The fact that black drivers are 23% more likely to be pulled over than white drivers, between 1.5 and 5 times more likely to be searched, while shown to be less likely than whites to turn up contraband in these searches, and more likely to be ticketed and arrested in those stops. These, th this increase in stops, searches, and arrests also leads to a 3.5 to 4 times higher probability that black people will be killed by cops. This increase is the same for Native Americans interacting with police, a shamefully underreported statistic. Even when we aren't, tar aren't arrested or killed, we are still more likely to be abused and dehumanized in our stops. A 2016 review of a 13-month period showed that Oakland police handcuffed 1,466 black people in non-arrest traffic stops and only 72 white people. And a 2016 study by the Center for Policing Equity found that blacks were almost four times more likely to be the subject of force from police, including force by hand, such as hitting and choking, pepper spray, taser, and gun, than white people. So maybe that time I got pulled over wasn't about race. Maybe the time I'd been pulled over before that wasn't about race. Maybe even the time before that. But those who demand the smoking gun of a racial slur or swastika or burning cross before they will believe that an individual encounter with the police might be about race or ignoring what we know and what the numbers are bearing out. Something is going on and it is not right. We are being targeted. And you can try to explain away one statistic due to geography, one away due to income. You could find reasons for numbers all day, but the fact remains. All across the country, in every type of neighborhood, people of color are being disproportionately criminalized. This is not all in our heads. When we first learn to drive, it's with the same excitement of anybody else newly behind the wheel. A bit of fear mixed with a sense of freedom and power. But while our white friends quickly settle into the mundanity of the daily commute, we never get a sense of ease. The first time I was pulled over was at age 16 for going five miles over the speed limit in a wealthy white neighborhood. I explained that I hadn't realized the speed limit had been recently lowered, but the cop wanted to know if I was drunk, if I was on drugs, what he would find if he looked at my trunk. I believe I answered, snacks. <laughs> a few months later, I was pulled over for not coming to a complete stop on a suburban road, empty of all traffic except for me and the officer. I've been stopped for having my vehicle tabs expired by one day, even though it was still within the month indicated on the tab, which meant that the, the officer was scanning my plates for the hell of it. Time and time again, the questions I was asked were the same lines. What are you doing in this neighborhood? Have you been drinking? Do I smell marijuana? Do you have any illegal substances or weapons in your car? I know it sounds silly, but it surprised me every time. Never been a big drinker. I've never driven drunk, and weed never did anything for me. I have no criminal record, no past indication of dangerous driving or violence. And yet, by the age of 18, I couldn't shake the feeling that cops were out to get me. And this experience is even worse for many black men and for those who have criminal records that give cops even more reason to harass them. Like myself, most people of color I know do not enjoy driving. We have moments where we forget what our blackness means behind the wheel when we are enjoying a great song on the radio or leaving a fun event. For a few moments, we are driving like any other carefree American, but then our pulses rise at the sight of an officer on the street. Will this be the time? The moment the lights on the police cruiser go on, we know that's for us. 
We are watching our speed and using our turn signals, and yet when those lights go on, we know that there is no other car that the officer is going to pull up behind than ours. And we pray that our paperwork is all legit, and that the officer won't be afraid of us, that we won't make the wrong moves or say the wrong things. And we hope that all we get out of this encounter is a ticket and a nervous stomach. And I'm not sure what's worse, the fear and anxiety and fatigue brought on by yet another encounter with an officer that you are hoping and praying to make it out of intact, or the never-ending denial by the rest of society of the fear and anxiety and fatigue you experience as a valid response to the near constant reminder that those assigned and empowered to protect you see your skin color as evidence of wrongdoing and who take your freedom and even your life at any time with no recourse. In this individualist nation, we like to believe that systemic racism doesn't exist. We like to believe that if there are racist cops, there are a few individual bad eggs acting on their own. And with this belief, we are forced to prove that each individual encounter with the police is definitively racist or it is tossed out completely as mere coincidence. And so, instead of a system imbued with the racism and oppression of greater society, instead of a system plagued by unchecked implicit bias, inadequate training, lack of accountability, racist quotas, cultural insensitivity, lack of diversity, and lack of transparency, we are told that we have a collection of individuals doing their best to serve and protect outside of a few bad apples acting completely on their own. And there's nothing we can do about it other than address those bad apples once it's been thoroughly proven that the officer in question is indeed a bad apple. So acknowledging us, believing us, means challenging everything you believe about race in this country. And I know that this is a very big ask. I know that this is a painful and scary process. I know it's hard to believe that the people you look to for safety and security are the same people who are causing us so much harm. But I'm not lying and I'm not delusional. I'm scared and I am hurting and we are dying. And I really, really need you to believe me. Few subjects shed greater light on the racial divide in the US than the subject of police brutality. Gallup's polls of white and black Americans on their opinions of police in the US show that more than double the percentage of white versus blacks have confidence in police or view them as honest and ethical. And whites are twice as likely as blacks to believe that police treat racial minorities fairly. But this same racial disparity in our feelings about the police is matched by disparities in our encounters with police. As described earlier in this chapter, People of color are more likely to be stopped by police, arrested by police, assaulted by police, and killed by police. When we look at the difference in opinion towards confidence in our police force, along with the difference in experiences with our police force, it's easy to wonder how it's possible that we all live in the same country. If we want to understand how experiences and sentiment between police and communities of different races could be so different, we must first understand the historical relationship between police forces and communities of color. There has not been a time in American history where our police force has not been, had a contentious and often violent relationship with communities of color. Our police forces were born from night patrols who had the principal task of controlling black and native populations in New England and slave patrols who had the principal task of catching escaped slaves and sending them back to slave masters. After the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, catching and re-enslaving black people became a job of night patrols as well. And that job was continued on after the night patrols were turned into the country's first police forces. Our early American police forces existed not only to combat crime, but also to return black Americans to slavery and control and intimidate free black populations. Police were rightfully feared and loathed by black Americans in the North and the South. In the brutal and bloody horror of post-Reconstruction South, local police sometimes joined in on the terrorizing of black communities that left thousands of black Americans dead. In the South, through the Jim Crow era and the Civil Rights Movement, 
it was well known locally that many police officers were also members of the Ku Klux Klan. Though much of the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, American police forces were one of the greatest threats to the safety of black Americans. Our police force was not created to serve black Americans. It was created to police black Americans and serve white Americans. This is why even when police were donning white hoods and riding out at night to burn crosses on the lawns of black families, white families could still look at them with respect and trust. Our police forces had starkly different roles within the white community that they were responsible to. Police abuse and oppression of people of color was not stopped at black Americans. Hispanic and native populations have also long been the recipients of higher rates of arrest, assault, and death at the hands of police. And police have been used throughout history to intimidate, punish, and silence activists and protesters in all minority racial and eth ethnic groups. Our police forces were, not, were created not to protect Americans of color, but to control Americans of color. People of color were seen by police as an inconvenience at best and a threat at worst, but never as people to protect and serve. This desire to control the behavior of people of color, along with disregard for the lives of people of color, has been woven throughout the history of American policing. This general attitude towards communities of color was also built into police training and police culture, and strong remnants of that remain today. It is understandable then that the fear and mistrust of police are also woven throughout the history of communities of color, especially black America. The trauma from police brutality has been felt over multiple generations. The generational wounds of police brutality and oppression have not healed because the brutality and oppression is still happening, even if cops are no longer wearing white hoods or letting their attack dogs loose on us. Yes. Our police officers are far less likely to be, to be seen joining lynch mobs, and far fewer of them explicitly see controlling the black population as their main job. But our police force is much larger and much more powerful than it was in the past. And the narratives and organizational structure that promoted the terrorizing of black Americans and communities of color in the past protects the harassment and brutality against black Americans and communities of color in the present. This is not to say that the majority of our police officers are racist, hateful monsters. When looking at anti-black bias and police actions, we are looking at the product of police cultural history that has always viewed black Americans as adversaries, and of a popular culture that has always portrayed black Americans as violent criminals not worthy of protection. From our books, TV shows and movies, to our crime focus on news programs, the narrative of the black brute is as strong now as it was when Birth of a Nation was released to wide acclaim in 1915. We hear this repeated in the language of our TV pundits and our politicians. Who will do something about this inner city crime? Who will keep our, seat, our streets safe from these thugs? Who will protect us from these super predators? The belief that black people still need to be controlled by police is promoted by our politicians and funded by our taxpayers. This belief that black people and people of color are more dangerous, unpredictable, and violent is not something that I believe most police officers and other Americans even know that they believe. But they do believe it deep down. This implicit bias against people of color is so insidious that, even, that not even people of color are exempt from having it. Which is why, yes, even police officers of color can show bias against civilians of color. Implicit bias is the, belie is the beliefs that sit in the back of your brain and inform your actions without your explicit knowledge. In times of stress, these unexamined beliefs can prove deadly. And a large portion of police encounters with police, with people of color, or with any people for that matter, are high stress situations where that implicit bias is more likely to take over at any hint of unpredictability or escalation and flood an officer with irrational fear. When an officer shoots an unarmed, unarmed black man and says he feared for his life, I believe it. But that fear itself is often racist and unfounded. 
I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that there is higher crime in some cities where larger minority populations live. Yes, black men are more likely to commit a violent offense than white men. No, this is not black on black or brown on brown crime. Those terms are 100% racist. It's crime. We don't call crime that happens in white communities white on white crime. Even though the majority of crimes against white people are perpetrated by other white people. Crime is a problem within communities. And communities with higher poverty, fewer jobs, and less infrastructure are going to have higher crime regardless of race. When the average black American has one thirteenth the net worth and the average Hispanic American has one tenth the net worth of the average of the net worth of the average white American, and when the poverty rate among Native Americans is over three times that of whites, it is a strong bet that neighborhoods of color are more likely to be poor neighborhoods with higher crime than that of higher priced neighborhoods with easier access to jobs and more funding for education that lead to less crime. Those would be more likely to be populated by comparatively wealthier white people. Preach. Crimes in communities of color is often compounded by the contentious relationship with police. Nobody wants a solution to crime in black communities more than black people do. They are the people most impacted by it. But when you cannot trust the police to protect you, who do you call to report illegal activity? When a crime happens, why would you cooperate with a police force that you do not trust to enforce the law without bias or excessive force? Police, as an extension of American society, are more likely to view people of color as dangerous, and people of color are more likely to view police as corrupt. This may seem on the surface as simple as miscommunication, old grudges that just need to be let go. This is often how it is discussed by the media and our politicians. If only we could just come together, we'd see that we are all good people. But these simple platitudes ignore the power dynamic at play in people of color's interaction with police. Just about every police officer that a person of color encounters will be armed, not just with a gun, but with the full force of a justice system that has shown just as much bias against people of color as the police have. And if someone is going to be harmed or killed in a police encounter, the numbers show that it most likely is going to be the civilian, not the police. When that harm is the result of an unjustified use of force against a civilian of color, most people of color know that the police officer involved will likely face very few consequences, if any. Police officers know this too. This is known in every encounter with police, every traffic stop, every domestic violence call, every welfare call. People of color do need and desperately want an effective police force to help keep their communities safe. And in order for a police force to be effective, it has to earn the trust of its people. But to those who only scratch the surface, to those who do not investigate their simplistic opinions about the root cause of crime in inner cities and the animosity between police forces and communities of color, the answer is simply more policing. But what we need is different policing. Policing not steeped from root to flower in the need to control people of color. If you are not a person of color, your relationship with these same officers is likely vastly different. The assumption that police officers would serve and protect the white community has existed as long as the assumption that police officers would control people of color. The long, well-established history of violence towards people toward and oppression of the white community simply does not exist in American policing. This does not mean that white Americans were never the subject to abuse by police, not at all. A look at our police force's history of abuse and persecution of the LGBT community is one of many examples that show otherwise. But by and large, even with occasional abuses of white civilians by police, most white Americans are confident that the criminal justice system is still to be trusted. Our police force is, an integral, is integral to white American feelings of safety and security in their communities. They are a valued part of the community. To question the integrity of police is to question the safety of the communities they serve. And that can be very unsettling to many who rely on that feeling of protection for their peace of mind. Preach. 
But that comfort and security that many white Americans have felt with their police is built on the oppression of people of color by those same police. The police don't just keep white communities safe. They save white communities from the evils of inner city crime. They are the heroes who keep Compton in Compton and Chicago in Chicago. Without the police, your white community would be just like those other communities. And it is white America's love of police that separates you from the crime-ridden ghetto. This is not something that all white Americans explicitly think or say, but it is the overwhelming narrative of our culture, our politicians, and our police forces. And that narrative shapes a lot of our conversations around policing and race. When talking about police brutality, it is important to remember that the police force can be trustworthy public servants to one community and oppressors to another community, just as we can live in a country that promotes prosperity for some and poverty for others. This can be the same police force in the same country without making any of these realities invalid. While numbers show that people of color are disproportionately targeted by police, they also show that white people in general trust and admire police. Both these statistics are true. But our goal should be to ensure that people of all races are able to feel safe and secure with our police forces. We need to recognize that the fear that people of color have of police is not merely rooted in feeling or culture, but in the separate and violent history that our police forces, our police forces have with communities of color. We must realize that there are two very different realities of how our police interact with white communities and with communities of color. And both of those realities have their own structure and history. We cannot address police brutality if we are not willing to recognize these differences and address the entirety of the specific history and structure of police interactions with communities of color. It is important when talking about police brutality to stand secure in your experience without trying to override the experiences of other communities with police. What has happened to you is valid and true, but it is not and has not happened to everyone. The experience of white communities with police are real and the experiences of communities of color with police are real, but they are far from the same. And while it is important to recognize these different viewpoints, we must remember this. If you do trust and value your police force, and you also believe in justice and equality for people of color, you will not see the lack of trust on behalf of, your, of communities of color as simply a difference of opinion. You will instead expect your police force to earn the respect and trust of communities of color by providing them with the same level of service that you enjoy. People of color are not asking white people to believe their, that their experiences so that they will fear the police as much as people of color do. They are asking because they want white people to join them in demanding their right to be able to trust the police like white people do. Right, that's the end of the chapter. Thank y'all. <laughs> Is that good? Yes. All right. We just wanted the feedback. So thanks, everybody. Oh, well, thank you first for the reading. Um, I personally, I think, learned the most from that chapter, and I really do appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in and get some questions going for you. Um, the first thing I was curious about, um, you share a lot of very personal information about your life experiences in this book. And uh, I was just wondering how. I guess kind of like the transition between it being your personal life and it becoming more of a public life was for you and maybe um, considerations you had to make for uh, your self-care routine. 
Yeah, self-care uh, is not a thing I have. I don't know. Um, it's not a thing. <laughs> it's not a thing I have. I was talking about this actually in my book opening, and it was funny because Melissa Harris Perry was here, and then she rushed backstage just to tell me that it only gets worse. <laughs> She was like, girl, I know you gotta go, but I just wanted to let you know, like, I'm a decade older than you, and it is even worse. You never have self-care. Like, maybe you'll get a cup of tea once a month. That's about it. <laughs> and then she left. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's tough. Um, I, I have always included a lot of personal in my writing. Um, that's my writing style. That's how my writing was born. Um, the book was in particularly tough, though, because oftentimes I think, I think people think the majority of my writing is tougher than it is. I do include a lot of deep, deeply personal things in my essays, but usually those are things I've come to peace with. I have to, I have to be able to in order to know what to learn from it, what to get out of it, and what would you know communicate well. It doesn't mean it's easy, but I'm at least at a point where it's not unhealthy. You know, I have the framework. I'm not in it at the moment. Um, but for the book, I, you know, I, the chapters I included, I had to include in service of the book. And that meant oftentimes that like when I was looking through my past and my life to find um, anecdote for the chapters, the anecdote would be something I hadn't thought of in 20 years and was not at all, you know, in any way made any peace with, you know. Um, so there were times where it was incredibly difficult and it was just kind of a really plotting effort. You know, I would get through, one anecdote and then just fall asleep, you know, and then the next day I would, you know, look at it and be like, oh, I can't handle that, and I would do, you know, more research, and I just kind of had to really, I had to push through, um, you know, I couldn't cut a chapter because the anecdote wasn't something I was ready to talk about yet, um, it all had to be included, and so it was a long process, and it was at times really, really painful and very exhausting, um, but I'm glad I did it, I'm glad I I was able to push through with the anecdotes I had because I, you know, I knew that they were things that I thought people would, if not directly relate to, um, at least would give a clear picture of some of the ways in which these things impact us in our day-to-day -day lives. So, yeah, I mean, I did, you know, I guess there was a period of time where I also had health issues while I was working on this, and then I, like, had one of those, like, day spa memberships and I would go in the middle of the day and it was so funny because you know I work from home and my kids so when my kids are at school would be the best time and so in the middle of the day I would go for like an hour and be like I'm gonna go sit in this hot tub but I wasn't the only struggling person with that idea like if you go to a lady spa at 11 on a Wednesday it's like the most relaxing depression session you've ever been to <laughs> Like, everyone's like, my therapist told me I had to do something. <laughs> and we would just sit there, and I'd be like, hey, how's the job search? Not, not good, you know? Then, but there's bubbles, so um, it was an interesting time. I actually ran into one of the women I used to see all the time when we'd talk, and she was in this, like, long, hard process in her life, and so she was, her therapist had told her she needed to go to the spa, and I was going to the spa because I was tired of crying, and, and um, I ran into her at the grocery store, and I didn't recognize her with any clothes on. It was... <laughs> Um, so that was kind of my self-care for a while. Um, and, you know, I put on a lot of makeup. That helps a lot. Um, you can't think about anything if you want your makeup to turn out okay. You just have to focus on that so you'll be like, oh, you know, the world sucks. Let me put on more mascara. And for a while, you're just trying not to stab yourself in the eye. And, you know, it's a good break. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Um, moving on, um, one thing I was curious about, um, do you think that the reclaiming of historically oppressive phraseology is um, more helpful or harmful to its community? I think that's going to be on the individual community members, whether or not. I don't think that there's any, I think we have to step away from the idea of collective action in minority communities as if like this shared burden of respectability. Um, if it helps one person to be able to say nigga and then it doesn't help another person, the per let the person who it helps say it, the person who it doesn't don't. Um, and none of that should reflect on us as a community because A, it has no, it, it, it has nothing to do with communities outside of our own, what language we use in the community. Um, so that'll be our discussion. And if your mom doesn't allow you to say it and it would be detriment to your health to say it, then don't say it. 
Um, but outside of that, it should have absolutely no impact on how other communities treat us. We have the right to define our own language for ourselves. Thank you. Um, another thing I was interested in in your um, style of writing in this book, um, and again, dealing with your personal voice being included, um, I think that the way this was written, kind of like a big primer, you know, so you want to talk about race, here's how you're going to do it. Um, what's the, I guess, um, importance of the personal voice being included, and how did you decide to weave that in through the work? Well, like I said, it's always been a part of my writing. It's kind of how I started writing. You know, I started writing not to be a writer um, at all. I started writing because I needed, like, the dudes in my cubicle next door to stop, you know, saying racist shit all the time. And so I was like, maybe they'll see this. Um, this was before subtweeting was a thing. Uh, I, I might not have ever become a writer if subtweeting had come along earlier and I could just subtweet everyone. Um, but, so... Of course it was personal, because then, because my motives were personal, the people I was hoping to reach were personal. Um, these things started, you know, as Facebook posts and, like, little blog posts and things like that. I'm really just hoping that the community around me, my local community, would hear. So, you know, my logic was, okay, maybe they just don't get that this happens to me, or they don't get that this impacts me. So I was like, what if I include these stories? So that's kind of how my writing style started. I wasn't about to, like, like run from that too much in the book. Um, at first, I wasn't sure what the format of the book would be, but I realized, um, you know, for these topics, a lot of times the reason why my work, I think, seems to resonate with people is in including the personal, you're putting your own skin in the game. Like, you're putting your vulnerability out there. You're saying, this is what I've lived. Here's a little bit of my pain. Maybe here's where I've kind of screwed this up. Here's where I've learned something. Because you're also asking your readers to do this, especially about these sensitive topics. You're asking them to maybe see themselves in not the greatest light when they're reading your work. And if you come to it as if you've always gotten everything, as if this is easy for you and it should be easy for everyone, um, people are going to sometimes feel preemptively shamed out of even looking at it. And I had to put, you know, I think that this is, this is where it gets complicated too, because, you know, I include a lot of personal in my book. Um, and I do that, that's my pitch, right? That's my, that's the heartstring tug that I have to do to keep some people with me. But it's also the bit of recognition that I think a lot of people of color need to know that there are real people behind these words um, and that, you know, their reality is somewhat reflected. That this is someone who themselves has lived it and it's not some weird impersonal, you know, um, overview of an issue that doesn't impact the person writing it, which is often how we've talked about race throughout history. And so I needed, you know, I needed people of color to be able to see this and have that little bit of catharsis and say, oh yeah, 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 you know, I've been there, I know this. Um, but also, you know, unfortunately, a lot of white readers also needed to feel a little sad outside of the generational, this is hurting people of color, you know, outside of the whole general idea of it. They needed to, like, you know, they need to see the tears. They need that little bit of it in order to keep reading. Um, it's unfortunate. It works on, for me because on a larger scale I have the platform to engage a lot of people, but unfortunately what this means is oftentimes in interpersonal relations, many white people treat people of color as their own personal journey through racial understanding and they'll come up and be like, tell me something to make me cry so that way I know this matters. Um, <laughs> And to go through all of that and you have maybe a 15% chance of it making any measurable difference um, means it's not a good deal. <laughs> and so part of, you know, for me, I write this book. It's not a charity thing. I got paid to write this book, you know. <laughs> and so I'll do the effort. I'll put my stuff out there. I'll put the pain out there along with countless other writers of color throughout generations after generation have tried to do because at least I know that you know maybe if you know if 30,000 people buy my book and 1,000 of them get it you know at least I got paid and then there's a thousand less but I'm not having these conversations one-on-one -on -one. and I don't expect you know I don't want people of color to as well and I'm hoping and a lot of times what I'm seeing what's really cool is a couple of people of color have reached out to me and been like hey, you know, I was having this issue, and I don't want to talk to this fool anymore, so I just, like, opened your book and handed a chapter, and I said, read this. Um, and that, to me, is, like, awesome. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I got to save you a little work there, because, you know, 
um, it's so funny because sometimes people will, will message me and be like, I wish this book had come out a week ago when so-and-so was messing up. I'm like, don't worry, you'll get another chance. <laughs> So, you know, for me, that it's a, it's a natural writing style, but it was also, I think, very necessary. This book covers a lot of topics. And so you have to keep, unless you are, you know, unless you're personally invested in this heavily, or unless this is like your thing to be the person who knows everything about race, maybe on social media or something, uh, getting through all of these chapters, all of these topics that can be quite complex, um, you're gonna need that constant grab to pull you back as to why this matters. But also I think too, so much discussion on race is at the either purely number of level or at the catastrophic level. We think about race when when there are black people dying in the streets, or we think about race when like a new report of income you know, disparity comes out. And those are the only ways we think about it. But I think that it's really important to understand that the toll that this takes on most Americans of color is in the absolute day-to-day, -day, non-stop hammering away at your humanity. And so those were a lot of the chapters I chose to pick because I wanted people to see this in their everyday interactions. And if they're able to go to the office and come, and come home and not have regular reminders that because of the color of their skin, they aren't taken seriously um, and aren't welcome, then they're lucky and it's also a sign that there's something deeply wrong. And so that's kind of, you know, I needed people to see beyond, I, I want to modernize this conversation. I want to pull it away from the only times we have to worry about race is if someone's being murdered or if someone's spray painting a swastika somewhere or if someone's shouting the n-word because that's not actually what's killing us. Um, and I need people to look at the everyday ways in which this is impacting people of color, but also the everyday ways in which they're contributing to this impact. Thank you. So speaking of modernization, um, as a young person finishing up um, my college education, one thing I'm curious about is um, what I should be looking for to, to change, you know? Um, and so one thing that I was thinking about, um, you've mentioned affirmative, affirmative action has seen success, but also that um, it can be very stigmatizing. Um, and so what I'm curious about is, um, would you have maybe any advice for up and coming generations um, entering the workforce? Um, um, what should we keep in mind while forming um, standards against institutional oppression? I would say the number one advice I would have is to look at your current situation and where you interact with systems of power. We all interact with it in different places at different stages of our life. And that means that like, if you're on a college campus, your system of power that you interact with the most is likely going to be your professors, your classmates, but also any time you vote, particularly in local elections. Um, as you get into the office, your circle of power is going to include your co-workers. If you are a manager or a supervisor, it will include you know, pe upper management, people that work with you. Um, and you know so on and so on but at every stage of life especially because this is how intersectionality works we all have different areas of power and different areas of oppression you're gonna have to personalize your search you're gonna have to look where you're at right now and say okay this is where I have some power I have, I have the power to raise my hand in class and speak up about assignments that aren't inclusive or are harmful I have the power when I vote in my local elections to figure out where our local politicians stand on issues of police accountability, school funding, you know, what, what the tax dollars are going to, what they're doing about affordable housing. Um, you know, I have the power when I'm sitting at the dinner table and one of my relatives says something racist to challenge that and have that conversation. But in each of these spheres, you have power and you have to find it and that's where you decide to act and that's where you focus your research. And so then you can look up different strategies for what you're doing there, but it's really important to understand these things are important not because it's like busy work, it's gonna make you feel like you're doing something, but because all of our pillars of society start small and the, you know, all, our entire structure starts with how we interact with the system. What the system wants is for us to do nothing. It doesn't actually need us to be like enthusiastically upholding it. We just fit into it and we're playing our part. And that means you need to look at where you're interacting with the system and see what you can disrupt. It's important to remember that anywhere in your, ask, in your life where things are easy, 
is usually a symbol of power. And if you're sitting in class and the curriculum sounds right to you and natural and things seem easy to you, if even getting into college seemed easy to you, you know, if you're watching a movie and every character seems relatable to you, all of these areas where your life seems simple, that's where you need to pause and ask who it's not simple for. And realize that, you know, that, that's a symbol of a room you are in that others are not in. And if people are in that room, they cannot ask the questions, they can't demand changes, and that's where your power is. Where you, It's not even power, it's a responsibility. Because no one else can pick that up for you. So I would say, you know, constantly be willing to reevaluate. You know, when I was working in marketing, the power I had to make change looked completely different than now as a writer. And there are areas where I had it then, as far as corporate changes that I don't have now. There are areas of power I have now that I you know, didn't have in the past. Um, but every day, every single day, you're going to find opportunities to make change. Every single day, you're going to find something if you take the time where it's just easy. I mean, literally, if you're, if, you're wan if, if you're wandering through your day not thinking about race, every moment you're not thinking about it, ask why not. Because the truth is, is that people of color have to constantly think about it and navigate it. So if they're navigating something you're not navigating, it doesn't mean that that barrier isn't there. It means that you've just been able to walk right past it. So you need to pause and, and wonder. It's, it's, it's always interesting to me how people are like, why, you know, I, I really wish people of color would stop thinking about race. I really wish that until we can, that everyone would think about it. It's, it's one of the most brutal unfairnesses about this entire thing is that people of color have to spend so much time and energy dedicated to these topics when most white people can sit and decide for themselves when they're comfortable and safe whether or not they want to engage. Um, it should, it, it's terrorizing us and brutalizing us, which means it should at very least make those who care uncomfortable all the time. Um, and so just seek out the, the spots to become more uncomfortable and make everyone around you more uncomfortable. Um, and it should, it should work, but you have to be willing to constantly reevaluate that. A lot of times people will you know, say, oh, well, within my work, I did this thing, I'm done, give me my prize. And then you're like, cool, but like, eh, what about everything else? You know? um, so constantly be willing to reevaluate. But you know, start with where you are. You know, start with one asset aspect of life where you're like, hey, I have access to some decision makers, or I am a decision maker, and then do your research what you can do most effectively there, and then move on. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have time for one more question. Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot, um, I'm a student representative of my school's diversity center, and one thing we've been trained to do is, um, when being in dialogue, to make I statements, um, specifically to avoid uh, generalization type of things. And so I was thinking about this a lot um, in one of the chapters. I um, don't remember off the top of my head, but um, using I statements as more making conversation about myself. And so I was thinking about what should I be considering in conversation and how do I be a better active listener? Yeah. I would say it's really important when we're talking about issues of race or any other issue with severe systemic oppression and systemic imbalance is to recognize the historical context with which every conversation you're having falls into. So there's a power structure at play that you've been conditioned with your entire life. Part of the reason why people always say to avoid I statements, I mean to use I statements when talking about race, to avoid generalizations, it's, it's not necessarily to make people of color more comfortable, it's to make white people more comfortable because throughout their entire lives they've been led to believe that everything they accomplish or do, they do on their own, that they're not part of a bigger system, that you know they're just walking bootstraps. And <laughs> that needs to actually be directly challenged. It's always been the opposite for people of color. We've always had a collective responsibility. People could always point and be like, what about this person? Tell me, you know, do you denounce this person that did a bad thing? Do you, what do you think about this? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always weird to be talking about like your own personal life and things you've gone through and then someone will be like, what about Oprah? Explain Oprah. And you're like, what do you mean? I don't know, go watch her show. Does she have a book? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to explain Oprah. Um, and 
that collective responsibility is a tool of oppression for us. But there's an imbalance because white people have been forever allowed to avoid their collection, collective actions and the way in which they contribute to collective narratives and collective oppression of people of color. And so actually what needs to happen is the opposite. You need to always avoid individualist statements when talking to people of color as far as they're concerned because that's all we've been subjected to. We've always been subjected to um, being rounded up or rounded down um, to the, whatever the worst of one of our group has done or represents. Um, but white people actually need to do the opposite. They need to get really, start getting comfortable with, yeah, white people suck. Like, get comfortable with it. Sit with it and be like, as a collective, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and own that because you have to understand that you have been contributing to that. And understand that that narrative needs to be direct, you know, that there's an imbalance that needs to be done. A lot of times people think that we just, start on this weird, non-existent, even play field, and then everything will be okay. Like if we sat down and everyone was equally nice to each other and polite, and we just shared our life stories, that we would come together. But justice requires balance. And balance means you have to kind of counterbalance what's been going on. And it also requires that we see what we have benefited from and the debts we owe, um, and how we don't actually just bring ourselves to conversation. That we bring the privilege that we've lived with, we bring our collective narrative with us, um, and you have to be willing to sit with that. And so I would say, it is very frustrating to talk about race with white people who want to make it about themselves and their feelings. Because everything has been about themselves and their feelings. And we're trying to get people to understand a systemic oppression. The thing about systemic oppression is that individuals contribute to systemic oppression, which means they have to be able to see themselves as a collective. But also it means that it, it gives blanket consequences on individuals, and therefore those impacted by oppression need to be seen as individuals because they aren't by the wheels of oppression. And so it kind of needs to go that way. When you're sitting down to have t these discussions with people of color, you need to allow them to be as personal as they need to be and see them as individuals because the oppression which you are collectively a part of never does. Um, and part of your balancing is to actually see yourself as part of a collective tool. Um, it is oftentimes an escape of responsibility to demand when you are participating in collective oppression, to then demand that you're seen as an individual. Um, and so that's, you know, I, I think that oftentimes these discussions, the way that they're framed are often framed around white comfort and it's just a perpetuation of white supremacy. And so even in our social justice movements, even in our activism training, oftentimes we are settling for what we think is a more benign white supremacy than the one we have. But you cannot build freedom with oppression. <laughs> That's not how it works. Um, and you have to start with something completely free of it. And that means that every little step we take, we have to be examining for how we might be perpetuating um, racism and white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. The bar of Genesis, Mike. We have time for two questions from the audience. Hands, hands. All right, right in front. Hi, I'm Native American. I'm Cherokee and Shuswap First Nation, and. It can be very exhausting coping with racism. So how do you pick your battles? Like as a native woman, Halloween's a bad time because you have these Pocahontas costumes and <laughs> the costumes are that, you know, native women always wear these skin tight with their bosom falling out type short costumes and that's supposed to be Native American. And people don't understand that's offensive or that they, um, appropriate uh, war bonnets mm -hmm. and those are given to our native leaders uh, and they have a lot of meaning to them but you see them at Coachella and, and other places and then also at Thanksgiving time I can remember being a little girl and uh, we would take paper bags and cut them up and fringe them and they were supposed to be like you know native vests and uh, the whole idea of like we 
go from one kindergarten room to the other and share popcorn. And, <laughs> and that was the whole story of Thanksgiving. So how do you pick your battles of when to talk of? You know, that's my question. I would say, you know, I hear this from a lot of people of color. And I want to first say, because a lot of this, I think, is grounded on the misconception that it is our job to deconstruct racial oppression. It's not. I mean, if we could, we would have done it a long time ago. Um, you know, it, it, it exists because we are disempowered. So I think it's important to realize that your survival alone is always going to be a revolutionary act. Because that alone is not what the state and our society wants for you. Um, so you, however you need to live that's not harming others is probably one of the most revolutionary things you can do, especially as an indigenous person where the government is trying actively to do whatever it can to suppress your numbers and kind of just, you know, test you and, you know, burden you out of existence as a culture. Um, existing proudly as yourself, that's your number one thing you can do for yourself. But I would say your answer of what you have, what you should do, what you should take on, it's going to first need to be just looked at based on what bandwidth you have. Um, do what feels right for you. For me, it fluctuates. So there are times where I'm like, I don't have time. I'm not dealing with anyone. And then there are times where like, I have, I, I'm feeling petty and I've got six hours. Um, <laughs> And we're going to go over this over and over again. I'm going to annoy you, at least. If I can't win you over, I'm going to make it so that you're like, I don't want to have that conversation again, so I'm not going to do this. I don't care. I, whatever it takes. I don't care about people's motives. I firmly believe you can annoy a lot of people into doing the right thing. Um, but I, I would say this. When it comes down to like your everyday interactions with people, you are never going to tire <laughs> for things you know, you're never going to run out of things to speak up about. We're not going to run short of microaggressions and macroaggressions. So oftentimes, I'd say it's really important as people of color to recognize that it is true that most of these conversations don't work out. Most of these conversations take a lot out of us, and then we get nothing for it but more pain and disappointment. And I say this because it's true. And you'll get over one disappointment and there'll be another one waiting around the corner. And I say this because sometimes when you're running low on energy, what you need to do is look at, is this a situation that's worth it? Is my pain big enough? Is my need to say something worth it today? Then say something. Or do I love this person enough to risk this painful conversation, say something. Do I feel like I need to act out of love for myself and say something today? Say something. And if you're like, you know, I just got to get somewhere and I'm tired and I don't want to talk about this, don't. People of color need to start looking at what they can do to help, li help lift that burden. It's not indigenous people wearing the war bonnets to Coachella. And Chances are people wearing them aren't traveling with indigenous people. They're traveling with other white people, right? So why, why do you have to be that person? A lot of times people think that that's like selfish, like, oh, are we pulling back? No, you know what? Self-preservation isn't selfish, especially in a society that constantly expects us to labor for free. Thank you. And educating white people on racism, going through these painful conversations, that is your labor that's being taken from you for free. And white people need to pick up some of that burden. And so I would definitely say, you know, you do what's best for you. So sometimes, some people have so much energy and they're like, no, I need to be talking about this all the time. And if that's your personality, that's what you need, do it. Just always know that you have the right to define for yourself what you pick up and take down. Because we so rarely get to choose when to address race. And there will be so many times where you won't have the choice as to whether or not you're going to address it because the issue is so dire or so important that you have to. So know that you're still gonna have to conserve energy for that. And then pick who's worth it. And you know, let your, let your own self be your guide. And expect everyone in your life who's white and cares about you to start looking at how they can help pick up that burden. You know, look at it delegating. You know, be like, look fool, you're my friend. 
and I'm busy, and you don't have to deal with all this, so you have a little more time, and I need you to pick up these pieces. And I think that that's something that you know needs to be done, because I hear so much more often from people of color asking me how much of this burden they need to continue to take on than I ever hear from white people about what they can do in their everyday lives. Like, they, they want to know where to send a check. Um, they want to know what to post on Facebook. But they don't want to know how to talk to their mom. They don't want to know how to talk to their boss. They don't want to know how to get to city council meetings. Um, and that's really unfair. Because we're constantly trying to find things and be creative. And so, you know, don't feel like, know that it's your right to define every day and to change your mind. If you talk to one person one day about an issue and you don't feel like talking to them the next, fine. Um, but, you know, I think we need to go a little easier on ourselves. <laughs> um, also, because the way intersectionality works, while we are being oppressed, there are also areas where we are oppressing others and where things are easier for us because they are harder for others. And we will have to, if we truly believe in justice, be able to reserve a little of our time for seeking that out and doing that work. And there's really just so many hours in the day. So let some fools go and hope that a white person will pick them up and then look at you know what you can do to fight ableism or make things safer for trans people of color. Um, and look there where your power and your privilege can go elsewhere because you're gonna need energy for both. Thank you. I wasn't correct when I said two questions, so you got it. Yay. Uh, we have, Jenna has one more question, and then we're going to move on to the signing. Close up. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh, okay. Here. Here. That might be good. <laughs> um, you give a lot of opportunities and education on how to act um, and options to take for action. And so I guess if you could summarize in just one statement maybe, um, what do you think makes a good um, ally or a good activist? Um, well, I would say first it's important to recognize those are going to be two separate things. Oftentimes, I like to say um, having allies is a lot like when you lose something and you're 10-year-old child is trying to help you find it um, because they just kind of follow you around <laughs> and you're like I already look there <laughs> they're like I'm trying to help you and then you keep bumping into them and you get really frustrated and a lot of times having allies is like that we were like I'm going to stand next to you at a smarch, or I'm going to like your Facebook status. I'm going to repeat everything you say verbatim um, when I feel safe and comfortable. And you're just going to trip over me constantly as I'm asking you if I did this right. Um, and so I think it's really important if you want to be an ally. <laughs> what, you going to try and pretend like you're good at helping me find things now? I'll give you a second afterwards to say something embarrassing about me if you want. <laughs> so get thinking while I finish this question. <laughs> um, but not too embarrassing. <laughs> I am your mom. All right, be creative. Um, I think that, you know, it's important first off, I think one of the most fundamental things that people could understand is knowing that they have vastly different roles in this <laughs> and that their role needs to be tailored to their privilege and their power. So stop, like it's really frustrating to get messages from white people saying I need like exact steps as to what I need to be doing right now. And I'm like, I don't get your people. I didn't build this. I don't know what you talk about at brunch. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to do a little of your own, you know, research and a little lived experience. You know. We, we have done all the work to identify the problem. We have done all the work to share why it's important and why it matters. We have done all the work to say what we need as far as the final outcomes for this. And you gotta do your work and realize where your particular role as an ally is. Um, and realize what you need to do while not annoying people of color and not you know, running into them all the time, what you need to do in the spaces that they don't have access to. And so I would definitely start looking, and it's, it's, it, it always amazes me at how um, reluctant white people are to actually look at 
white collective action around race and to look at white structures. They want to talk about race, but really what they want to do is they want to like sit and watch Black Panther and then just like imagine Wakanda into real life, but then they also want a ticket there and they don't get how that whole concept works because they aren't invited. And <laughs> They want to do all that, but they don't want to sit there and be like, no, wait, what's this world we've created? What's this space we're in, this power structure that we're in? So don't, you know, I, I would love to see so much, you know, I, I'm tired of like having this talk about how one white person feels in black spaces and how one white person feels in looking at issues for people of color. And what I really want to know is what white people are learning collectively about whiteness, what whiteness means in society and what they are contributing and what their culture and history actually is so that they can start to deconstruct that and build something that they can actually really be proud of. Um, and so I would say start there. Like I would, I mean, I feel like y'all have way too much work to do to be bugging me all the time. <laughs> and I don't, you know, and I, I need that, I think that needs to be done. All right, so have you thought of something? Uh, I, we're out of time, buddy. This is your chance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, so he's, he's mimicking me. That's the thing I do. Yeah. It's my standard response to everything when I'm not paying attention. And so they like to copy me. He, in particular, yeah. So he, he yeah, that's it. If you want to know what it's like living with me, it's, it, that's what I do a lot. <laughs> <I'm> always... <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks for coming back to Tacoma.